was Pentecost, the end of the days of Easter and the launching into the time of the church. Pentecost, for that little community gathered in Jerusalem that Luke tells us about, for that little community, it was the time of the conclusion of the time of Passover, the 50 days after, Pente after Passover and Pentecost. And for us folks, us Christian folks, today it is 50 days after the great story, the revelation of the living Lord in the resurrection. So here we are. I, I, I hope some of you uh, have gathered, uh, have something read on to, to uh, signify the tongues of fire. I looked around. I have to own up. I own absolutely nothing but two sweaters, which I'm not putting on in the, for this occasion, that are red. I have, don't have red socks, don't have red shirts, definitely don't have red hair. And so, uh, I, but I hope some of you do, uh, are, are, uh, are wearing your red. So here we are with the, with the, uh, with that little, as Luke tells the story, that little community of Jesus uh, is gathered, the disciples gathered together in Jerusalem, and Luke tells us that when the day of Pentecost had come, the disciples were all together in one place, and suddenly there came a sound like the rush of a, a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. Wow, what an image, what a story. Luke's telling us, I think, friends, Luke's telling us that something pretty mighty important took place in the lives of those folks gathered together in Jerusalem, as he understands what had taken place. Something very, very important. How do you describe something so mighty as that? without wonderful imagery, the rushing wind, perhaps reminding us of the, of the wind of creation, the wind of God, the ruach, the, the breath of God that uh, poured out over and stirred up and with the spoken word, the logos of God created all that is. So maybe we're getting reminded about that by Luke. And the tongues of fire, the flame, the, the great sign of spirit and, and uh, power. Uh, so here we are. Gather together, says Luke. And something mighty happens. Now, we shouldn't be surprised. We should, should we? Because we remember last week or so, right? We were thinking about the ascension. And reminded of the ascension. And we remember what Jesus told him, I think this about his, his last words uh, at, the, at the time of the, uh, the account of the ascension. Last words were, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. To the ends of the earth. You'll be my witnesses. So we know we were warned that something big is going to happen. The disciples were warned something big was going to happen. And they were told to be ready for it, to be in one place, to be gathered together, and it would happen. And so it does. Now, I suggest that what was happening there was not only the consecration by the Spirit of God, of God's church, or the community of Jesus, not only the consecration, just as Jesus was consecrated at his baptism, so in Luke, the community is consecrated by the Holy Spirit. And I also suggest, though, that beyond that, we are being introduced to the new age. Now, some of you may remember some years ago now, that musical called Hair, 
And one of the songs in here was, this is the beginning of the age of Aquarius. Remember that, the age of Aquarius. Now I happen to have enough years on me that I've lived through the industrial age and into the postmodern age. And I may be so out of it that I'm in another age and don't know about it. But I suggest that there is yet another age, an overwhelming age, an age that is inaugurated with Pentecost, with the gathered community in Jerusalem, and that is the age of the Holy Spirit. We live in the age of the Holy Spirit, the age in which the Holy Spirit is constantly, constantly empowering us, empowering us to be witnesses to the great revelation of God in Jesus the Messiah, in the one we call Savior and Redeemer. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come. And the Holy Spirit has come. The Holy Spirit is coming. And the Holy Spirit will come. That is, the Holy Spirit is with the community of Jesus in all places and in all times. And thus, the Holy Spirit is with the community of Jesus in this time. Now, Acts begins with the instructions to be prepared for the gift of the Holy Spirit and to be ready to proclaim the good news, the kingdom of God, the good news in, that's revealed in Jesus, the kingdom of God, everywhere, to the ends of the earth, everywhere. And Acts ends with that being lived out by the great apostle Paul. Remember how Acts ends with Paul in Rome, not at the ends of the earth. He's at the center of the world of his day. He's in Rome, the imperial city, the home of Caesar. And what is he doing there? Well, here's how Acts ends. Here's Luke ends his, his story. He says of Paul, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all, all boldness and without hindrance. So the last we know about Paul from Luke is that Paul is teaching and proclaiming the kingdom of God. Paul is carrying out the mandate of the Holy Spirit. Paul acknowledges throughout his ministry, even as we read his letters, not only in Acts, but in Paul's own letters, always, always points to the power, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. That is, is not Paul who was speaking about Paul and from some special knowledge of Paul. But Paul is speaking through the power and the presence of the Spirit of God. Now, I think that even in these times we live in, and all they are rather interesting times, aren't they? Even in these times we're living in, these times when we're gathered together in one place over Zoom and YouTube, else Facebook maybe. That's how we gather together in one place, these times we live in. But I suggest that the mandate that was given in the first century to that little community of Jesus to proclaim and take the story of God's loving grace 
and the presence of God's kingdom, of God's justice and mercy, the very essence of, of God's creation, the very essence of which we've been created to, in the image of God, the image of God's holiness and God's mercy and God's justice, God's grace, God's joy, God's promise, that we are consecrated to live that and proclaim that, that the kingdom of God is proclaimed to the kingdoms of the world. And that's our job. Humbly we take it, right? Humbly we take it. We know, we know, that, we know that, it's, that it's not just a simple task. We know that, that, the, that the, the, the world, as Paul talks about the world and the scriptures talk about the world, that is that which doesn't understand the story of God's love and grace, doesn't have a concept of God's kingdom. We, we know that's difficult for, to, to help the world understand that. They understand that we're talking about a kingdom that is not bounded by, uh, by boundaries, by this river and that river and that border and that border. We're talking about the kingdom of God that lives in the human story, in the human experience, and that we have been baptized to be the living presence of that kingdom. So the Pentecost story is not a story about sometime by and by and far away and long ago. The Pentecost story is a story about us living in the age of the Spirit, in the age of the Holy Spirit, in the age in which we are, the disciples, with the rushing wind around us and tongues of fire landing on our heads. Amen.